Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Episcopal Church um, Bible study class. I'm Bill Stahl. Let's begin with a short prayer. Father, we ask for your help and your protection as the coronavirus continues to flare up, especially be with those uh, in our parish who have contracted the virus. Help us now to explore your word contained in the Bible. Give us strength and courage to live it. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. We're in the story of Joseph now. We began that last week. And uh, we saw where Joseph was sold into slavery by his uh, brothers uh, just out of jealousy because Jacob, their father, loved him more than the others. And Joseph has been, become very successful in Egypt. He is now second only to Pharaoh himself. And he is um, uh, gathering grain or having the farmers gather grain for the seven years of plenty. And now when the uh, seven years of famine begin, he starts to uh, sell the grain to the people. So today we look at the first meeting of Joseph and his brothers. The famine has not, is not only in Egypt, it has also expanded into the land of Canaan, affecting Jacob and his family. Jacob sends 10 of his sons down to Egypt to buy grain. He keeps Benjamin home, saying to himself, nothing must happen to him. Now, just as a little footnote here, notice he's called Jacob. Even though his name was changed to Israel, the author uh, still calls him most of the time uh, by his original name, Jacob. The 10 brothers journey down to Egypt and come before the man who has the authority to sell grain to the people. And they bow low to the ground before him. The man is Joseph, but they don't recognize him. Now this is plausible because Joseph was just a boy when they last saw him. And also because the brothers are expecting to meet an Egyptian and Joseph looks like an Egyptian. Uh, he is groomed like one with a clean shaven face and dressed as an Egyptian. But Joseph recognizes them. Instead of revealing himself to them, he speaks harshly to them. Where have you come from? They answer, from the land of Canaan. Joseph accuses them of being spies, but they say, No, my Lord, we are all brothers. We are not spies, but honest men who have come to buy grain. Joseph pretends not to believe them, and so they continue, We are twelve brothers. The youngest is home with our father, and the other is no more. But Joseph is adamant, insisting they are spies, and he holds them for three days. Then he says to them, Do this, and you will live, for I am a man who fears God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back to your, your starving families. But you must bring your youngest brother with you back to me uh, for your words to be verified, lest you die. The brothers argue amongst themselves in their own language, and they express their belief that all this is happening to them because of what they did years ago to their brother, the selling of their brother into slavery. They have no idea that Joseph understands their language. When Joseph can bear to hear no more, he leaves them and weeps. Upon his return, the brothers tell them that they agree to his terms and that Simeon will remain in Egypt while the others return home. Now you might be wondering why all this intrigue on the part of Joseph? Why didn't he just come out and say, I'm your long lost brother, uh, Joseph, and, uh, and let it be done with there? Well, there's a couple, three explanations for this. First of all, considering what they had done to him. Joseph may not have been so sure about these brothers. Could he trust them? He wanted to establish, if he could, that they were honest men and that they felt remorse for what they had done. And that, uh, that, that in fact occurs. 
Another reason may have been that, um, oh, now the thought escapes me. Oh, well. well oh, he, <laughs> that he wanted to uh, establish a relationship with them rather than just come out and say, I'm your brother Joseph. If he had done that, it's possible that the brothers would have been overcome with fear and terrified of what they're seeing before them, their brother Joseph, and just run away and gone home. So he's establishing a relationship with them on the pretense that he thinks that they're spies and, uh, and thereby when he finally reveals himself to them, uh, they feel that they can trust him. A third possibility is that the author might just simply have embellished the story to make it more dramatic. And I say that because it happens throughout the Bible. But I don't think uh, the author really needed to do that. I think the first two possibilities I gave you are, are quite plausible. Joseph orders their bags filled with grain plus provisions for their long journey home but he also has each man's money secretly returned to his sack. The brothers load up the donkeys and soon they're on their way. At the first campsite, one of the brothers uh, tends to the feeding of the donkeys. He opens his feed sack and finds his money. Forgetting his chore, he tells his brother what he found and their hearts sink. In panic and confusion, they look at one another and say, what has God done to us? They return home and tell their father all that happened. They explain why Simeon is uh, not with them and uh, that they must go back to Egypt with Benjamin. Then they empty their grain sacks and each one finds his money bag inside. All this is too much for Jacob. And he says, you are robbing me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. But Reuben says to his father, You may put both my sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Put Benjamin in my care, and I will bring him back. But the old man refuses, saying, If any harm came to him, it would send me down to show. Shoal is uh, an imagined underworld of the dead. Remember, I've told you before that uh, these people had no uh, belief or concept in life after death. And so they wondered, they questioned, well, what happens to a man when he dies? They knew what happened to his body, but they also believed in the existence of the soul. And they believed that the soul went to this underworld cavern of the dead where it slept forever, the sleep of death. The famine continues and eventually Jacob's family depletes all the grain the brothers brought from Egypt. Jacob tells his sons to go back for more, but they refuse unless they can take Benjamin with them. They're unwilling to face the man in Egypt without fulfilling the promise they made. To, that, to this, Jacob says, why did you bring this misery on me by telling me telling the man you had another brother. The man kept questioning us, they answered. He asked, is your father still living? Do you have another brother? We simply answered his questions. How are we to know, he would say, bring your other brother down here. Then Judah offers to take the boy in his own care. And he tells his father that he can hold him responsible. If anything happens to him, he will accept the blame. Judah is anxious to get started, saying, As it is, if we had not wasted so much time, we would have been back by now. Jacob reluctantly gives in. He suggests that they take gifts with them, such as balsam, honey, nuts, and almonds. And he tells them to take double the money and return that which had been put in their feed sacks. It may have been a mistake, he says. Then he concludes, Take your brother and go back to the man. And may God be merciful so that the man will let your other brother and Benjamin come back with you. As for me, if I must be bereaved, bereaved I must be. 
The brothers depart early the next morning, taking with them the gifts, double money, payment, and Benjamin. Arriving in Egypt, they present themselves to Joseph. When Joseph sees Benjamin, he tells his steward to take them all to his house and prepare a fine meal for them to be shared with him at midday. Realizing that they are being escorted to Joseph's house, the brothers become afraid. They fear that Joseph knows about the money and that he will make them his slaves. During the escort, they approach the steward and they tell him all that has happened. And they tell him that they brought the money back with them. But the steward, knowing Joseph, what Joseph has done and what he intends, says to them, peace to you, be not afraid. Your God put a treasure in your sacks. Your money reached me safely. Then he brings Simeon out to them. Upon entering the house, the brothers are given water to wash their feet and clean up. Then they arrange their gifts as they await Joseph's arrival at midday. When he arrives, he greets them kindly and asks them about their father. Is he alive? Is he well? Bowing low before him, they answer, yes, he is alive and he is well. Then Joseph looks upon his brother Benjamin, the son of his mother, Rachel. Is this your youngest brother, he asks. Then to Benjamin, he says, God be good to you, my son. Deeply moved by the sight of his brother, he hurries out to his private room where he weeps. Regaining his composure and washing his face, he returns and orders the meal served. He and the Egyptians are served separately because Egyptians would not take food with Hebrews. Indeed, they had a horror of it. But Joseph sits at the table with them, and the brothers look at one another in amazement. Joseph has portions carried to them from his own dish, and the portions given Benjamin are five times larger than the others. After the meal, Joseph privately tells his steward to fill their sacks with as much grain as they can carry and to return their money to their sacks as well. Then he tells them, put my silver cup in the sack of the youngest. Early the next morning, the 11 brothers load their donkeys and set off, but they have not traveled far before the steward, acting on Joseph's orders, overtakes them and accuses them of being thieves, that one of them has stolen his master's silver cup. They respond that they would never think of doing such a thing. Look, they say, we returned the money found in our sacks. Are we likely then to steal from your master's house? And they say, if the cup is found, the one who has it will die and the rest will become his master's slaves. Very well, says the steward. It will be as you say. So the brothers unload their grain sacks place them on the ground and open them. The steward inspects each one, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And there in Benjamin's sack, he finds the silver cup. The brothers are devastated and tear their clothes. They reload their donkeys and return to the city with the steward. Arriving at Joseph's house, they fall on the ground before him. What is this you have done? He demands. They answer, what can we say? How can we clear ourselves? We deserve to be your slaves, all of us no less than the one found to have the cup. But Joseph responds, I could not think of doing such a thing. Only the one having the cup will be my slave. The rest of you can go home to your father. Judah approaches Joseph and asks to speak to him in private. He says, and here I'm quoting Genesis 44, 20 to 34. We have an old father, and this is the youngest son born to him in his old age. His brother is dead, and he is the only one of his mother's sons left, and his father loves him. Our father said, go back and buy a little more grain. But we told him, we can only go down if our youngest brother is with us because of what you, my Lord, had ordered us. My father said to us, 
You know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me, and I said, He has sure, surely been torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too, and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. So now, if the boy is not with us when we go back to my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy is not there, he will die. We will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. We guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I even said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please let me remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would bring upon my father. Now, if this doesn't tug at your heart, well, I'm sure it does. This convinces Joseph, I'm sure, that these are good, honest men. A lot of years have passed since they sold him into slavery. And I think he has long since forgiven them for that. Indeed, he believes it was God's will because of what he's managed to do in Egypt. Joseph can no longer restrain his emotions. To his steward and the other Egyptians with him, him, with him he exclaims, let everyone leave me. He does not want any of them present when he reveals himself to his brothers, but he weeps so loudly that they all hear it and the news of it reaches Pharaoh's palace. He says to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? His brothers are unable to answer. They are horrified and dumbfounded. He invites them to come closer, and he says, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. But do not be distressed nor angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will not be plowing or reaping. God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and tell him. Tell him to come down to me. Do not delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children, and your grandchildren. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. You can see for yourselves. And so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Throwing his arms around Benjamin's neck, he weeps, and Benjamin weeps on his shoulder. Then Joseph kisses each of his brothers, weeping over each one. When Pharaoh learns about Joseph's brothers, he is happy to hear of it. He sends word to Joseph to tell his brothers to go back to Canaan and return with their father and all their family members. And he promises Joseph that he will give them the best land in Egypt on which to live. He commands Joseph to tell his brothers, get your father and come. Never mind your belongings for the best land in Egypt that the best land Egypt has to offer is yours. Pharaoh also provides carts for the wives and children to ride on. Well, that is the end of today's lesson. Next week, uh, our lesson will begin with Jacob leaving for Egypt. So let's end with a short prayer. Praise be Jesus Christ, sovereign of the universe and savior of the world. Amen.